and what we still do not know about this investigation. No stamp required. How to make sure your absentee ballot is counted come election day. Safe and spooky. Emory doctors have been on the front lines of the pandemic with research and warnings. Tonight they have advice for parents ahead of Halloween. When you hear it, probably not going to like it. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. We're trying to prevent twindemics of COVID plus influenza, which could be devastating. Dr. Kathleen Toomey with the Department of Public Health and Governor Brian Kemp today telling everyone to go out, get that flu shot this year in their first news conference together since early August. They have suggested that the president that the presence of COVID-19 in our community makes getting a flu shot more important than ever. They also said more than 300,000 doses of flu vaccine are available and drive through clinics are an option as well this year. Dr. Toomey also revealed that probable COVID-19 cases will be disclosed on the Department of Health website, making our numbers more accurate. These are the cases. Now, these cases come from antigen tests or spit tests. Whenever someone has a positive antigen test, they often have to follow that up with a PCR test, which is more accurate. The state's plan now is to report both of those tests separately, giving us a more accurate picture of our positivity rate and how widespread the virus is in our communities. We are still continuing to test, still encouraging people to get tested at our, at our sites, but are also recognizing that many people choose to go to an urgent care center or some other place where they can get these rapid antigen tests. Governor Kemp has touted the excellent progress that Georgia is making as it continues to try to bring down the number of COVID cases in the state. Hospital, uh, hospitalizations and deaths are down, so let's take a look at where they stand now. Our new cases reported are down 64% from our peak on July 24th. This is the graphic that shows what the governor is talking about. These are Georgia's new cases over time. The dotted line is the curve. The peak at the top was July 24th with more than 4,700 new cases reported in a single day. Today, that number is down about 1,400 to 1,400. And when we look at how that average has dropped over the past 10 weeks, we see a significant drop of more than 60%. But when we compare that to May and June, today's average is higher. So we're not quite back down to the levels that we saw prior to the summer surge. Currently, our confirmed hospitalizations for COVID patients stands at 1,287. That's down 60% from our peak. Governor Kemp announced similar progress in bringing down the number of people in the hospital from COVID. July 24th was also a peak on that date with more than 4,800 people so ill that they needed serious treatment. Today, that number has stabilized. It's around 1,300 for the past few weeks. That's great news because it means there is space available to help take care of severe cases. The one area where we are still seeing much higher numbers is deaths. At the height of the surge, 72 deaths each day. Today, the number is down close to 30, but Georgia is still above the national average for the size of our state and the number of our cases. We keep track of the latest COVID-19 numbers and trends every day. We even break it down county by county. You can find it all in the coronavirus special section on 11alive.com or on the 11 Alive app. Tonight, many questions remain in the disappearance of a 27-year-old mother of two. Natalie Jones was last seen in July. The GBI says investigators have found a body inside a car belonging to Jones in Heard County. We first brought you this information as breaking news last night in primetime. And tonight, our Joe Hinkey is looking into several unanswered questions so many people have about this case. The Heard County Sheriff's Office is leading this investigation and missing persons case, but has not released any information publicly in the past 24 hours. Meanwhile, the GBI behind me is assisting in this case and tells us an autopsy will be needed to positively identify the body found inside Natalie Jones's car. Today, we went to the location where her car was found last night in Heard County. Next to Roosterville Road in Heard County, behind a row of bushes, 
Natalie Jones's 2002 hot pink Chevrolet Cavalier was found Tuesday. While the GBI and Heard County Sheriff's Office have not publicly confirmed if the body found in the car here is Jones, her sister, Jessica Bishop, tells 11 Alive law enforcement told the family it is. Somebody has to know something out there. She didn't just disappear on her own by herself just out of nowhere. Last week we interviewed Bishop. Bishop told us the family did not have any answers, and now tonight they are still searching for answers. What is known from the Heard County Sheriff's Office is a missing persons case was opened in July. Investigators tell 11 Alive Jones was last seen in Jackson Gap, Alabama, just before 1 a.m. on July 5th, along with her car. Her family says when Jones went missing, all activity on her social media and bank accounts stopped. What remains unknown is how or why she went missing, how her car ended up in a wooded area, and how long it had been there. The Heard County Sheriff's Office has not released information about whether there are any signs of foul play or any suspects in this case. And today we also went to the Heard County Sheriff's Office. We've contacted the office multiple times requesting an interview so we can learn about the latest information in this case and the disappearance of Natalie Jones so far have not heard back. Let's get you caught up on some other stories making headlines today. A new eight foot fence is going up around the state capitol. It's part of a security upgrade costing around $5 million. Our cameras caught this trial run of the fence this morning. The Georgia State Patrol says it is going up to protect the capitol building from break ins like one that happened last year and from vandalism that the GSP says occurred during protests. A spokesperson says they are hoping this will eventually mean Georgia National Guard members won't have to help with security. The GSP doesn't know when the project will be complete. The fence is already getting some attention from lawmakers like Democrat State Representative Scott Holcomb, who says he does not support it. The former Alpharetta townhome of Bobby Christina Brown on the market once again. It's the same home where she overdosed in a bathtub back in January of 2015, eventually leading to her death. The 2600 square foot space was previously owned by her mother, Whitney Houston. According to Zillow, it was sold in March of 2016 after Bobby Christina's death. It is now listed at $599,000. Firefighters in Barrow County working to put out a large fire of burning debris and mulch burning since Saturday. They say it's been burning at Cowart Mulch off Highway 316 near Patrick Mill Road. They say no people or other buildings are in danger, but the smoke is causing visibility problems for drivers. Officials say they are working to figure out how the fire started. Well, your 11 Alive storm trackers are watching Hurricane Delta, and it is starting to strengthen slowly after weakening considerably. Having moved over the Yucatan, you could see just how much it was kind of disorganized as it moved across the northern edge, but within the last couple frames, starting to get more organized once again. And as of the 8 o'clock advisory, has strengthened five more miles per hour. So now it's at 90 miles per hour, max sustain. This time yesterday, it was at 145 miles per hour. So the Yucatan did disorganize it quite a bit. But it is going to be moving over uh, warm waters without a lot of shear. So we do expect strengthening to reoccur the next 24 to 48 hours before making landfall here. Louisiana coast has hurricane watches hoisted already. Tropical storm watches on each end. Storm surge watches as well from High Island, Texas, all the way over to Mobile Bay. And some of these storm surge or some areas could be in in fact, uh, impacted by a nine foot storm surge here in central Louisiana. So it does look like once again, the, the crosshairs are going to be on uh, southwestern Louisiana in the Lake Charles area, Cameron, Louisiana, unfortunately, after Laura already did a number on them earlier this season. So we are expecting strengthening as it heads over those warm waters. The next 24 hours or so becoming a cat two as early as tonight and then strengthening even more to a cat three as it approaches which is the Louisiana coastline, and then it's going to encounter a little bit of shear here, which may weaken it to a Category 2, but still winds up around 105 miles per hour upon landfall, and then working its way inland as a remnant low and bringing rain here across uh, much of North Georgia as we head in through the weekend. So coming up, we'll go hour by hour and let you know what you can expect and when you can expect to see the strongest of the storms. Samantha, thank you. It is a one-night only event for the election. Tonight, the vice presidential candidates will take the debate stage, an event that is framed by the COVID-19 outbreak inside the White House. The stage is set in the Intermountain West, and it is Salt Lake City in a mask tonight. That venue normally seats about 1,900 people. Only 250 will be allowed to attend this evening, and the debate comes with new 
COVID-19 safety measures. The candidates will sit over 12 feet apart, which is much more than the seven feet they had planned on, but there has been plexiglass shields installed and the candidates will have nine topics, 10 minutes for each one. Many are wondering if this one will get nasty and mean-spirited like the presidential debate did last week. Well, we won't know until it kicks off. The debate begins at nine o'clock. That is in 50 minutes. And NBC has all the special coverage on 11 Alive. Georgia has already accepted more absentee ballots for this upcoming election than were cast in 2016. 264,000 people have turned in their votes. Nearly a million and a half Georgians requested an absentee ballot. Now the state is offering an easy way to make sure your vote is counted with no stamp required. Our Liza Lucas explains. There are three options for sending in your absentee ballot. You can mail, hand deliver to your county registrar's office, or use one of these, an absentee ballot drop box. And there are regulations to keep the process in check. Drop boxes must be video monitored. They also must be located on government or county property and accessible to the public. Rules also require drop boxes be made to prevent tampering and built to withstand vandalism or bad weather. Want to use this option? You don't need a stamp for a drop box, but you do need to use a box in the county you're registered to vote. State election board rules require ballots be collected at least once every 72 hours, then collected daily in the eight days leading up to election day. Teams of two people who've sworn an oath, just like poll officers, will get the ballots. And rules require these ballots be immediately transported, processed, and stored, just like mailed absentee ballots. Drop boxes close at 7 p.m. on election day. A celebration of life service was held today for a Fulton County deputy killed in a crash on I-20 near Augusta last week. Family, friends, and colleagues gathered to say their final farewells to Officer Anthony White. White and fellow Deputy Kenny Ingram both died when their patrol car struck a tractor trailer on their way to pick up an inmate for transfer in Augusta. Ingram was laid to rest on Monday. Officials say the names of both officers will be added to the memorial for those killed in the line of duty. A fund first campaign has been now set up to collect donations for their families. You can find the link on our website. Just click on this story. The family of a man shot and killed by an Atlanta police officer continues to fight for justice. More than a year later, next, the new lawsuit filed by the family of Jimmy Atchison. Don't forget, we're streaming right now, and we look forward to hearing from you on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe, join in, easy to do. You won't regret it. You'll be glad you did. We have more 11 Alive news in prime time right after the break. Eleven Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at Eleven Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to Eleven Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. The family of a man shot and killed by an Atlanta police officer last year is filing a civil rights lawsuit. 
The lawsuit alleges serious violations in police operations that led to the death of 21 year old Jimmy Atchison. He was shot in the back while Atlanta police and the FBI were serving a search warrant at an apartment. According to the family, an investigation by the GBI indicated that Atchison was given conflicting commands by officers inside the room. The officer who shot Atchison saw Kim retire from the force shortly after the incident. No one has been charged in connection with Atchison's death. Last October, his family filed a civil suit against the FBI in the city of Atlanta for $20 million. Coming up tonight on Uplate, we will hear from the Atchison family attorney. That's on our sister station, 11 Alive, at 11 tonight. We are 11 Alive storm trackers watching those humidity levels that are associated with the tropics starting to kind of move in our direction a little bit, but we're still nice and dry, and we will be for the next 36 hours or so. So tomorrow is going to be just as nice as today was, and this evening is gorgeous. 65 degrees in Carrollton, 69 in Marietta, 73 in Atlanta, and we're at 69 uh, right now in um, Marietta and 67 in Rome, 59 in Blairsville. That's the cool spot right now. So our high temperature today was a little on the warm side. We should be around 75 and we were eight degrees above average with our high at 83 degrees. Our low 62 was a little above average as well. We should be around 57 this time of year. So unseasonably warm, but just absolutely lovely as we head into the overnight. Very few clouds around, good stargazing weather yet tonight and then as we head into our Thursday at 10 on the wisometer on that scale of 1 to an 11 with 11 being a perfect day a 10 just because it is going to be so unseasonably warm but it will be another gorgeous day to get things done out in the yard or just get a little extra exercise in before things get nasty over the weekend so we'll see the clouds start to increase on our Thursday but we will stay dry and then we'll have to watch as things start to change and we approach the weekend so unseasonably warm on our Thursday we'll see those clouds starting to roll in the humidity start to go up and then weekend rain from Delta now we think it'll probably hold off for the most part on our Friday. So here's the timing of that. Uh, we'll see it approaching the coastline. Again, the Louisiana coastline that's just been battered this hurricane season. And again, it seems to be aiming in southwest Louisiana. So Cameron in through Lake Charles, they're going to be greatly impacted with a major hurricane on Friday. So conditions really from overnight Thursday night into Friday going downhill for them. Then once it works its way inland it's going to weaken pretty quickly this time around so we do expect to see it weakening into a remnant low by the time it gets to the tennessee valley so this is saturday at 8 30 and we're seeing some showers start to work their way in well in advance of the uh, tropical system and then as we head in through the afternoon yeah we could see some thunderstorms i think during the afternoon and evening on saturday and then on saturday night into sunday so we're going to fast forward with a more of a long-term model this is the european model long-range model i should say and you can see how the moisture is being pulled in off the gulf the center of circulation up to our northwest over the tennessee valley but in these outer bands that's where we could see some of these strong to severe storms this is sunday morning so we'll be watching for some heavier downpours then getting into the afternoon as well we can't rule out an isolated severe storm or two and then once we get into Monday, still a little wraparound moisture to start out the work week. So the rain, of course, is going to be heaviest on the earliest part of the route here along the Mississippi River Valley, well, up through Louisiana and then, then through Arkansas. But we'll end up seeing probably an inch to two inches commonly across North Georgia over the weekend. But some spots that get hit harder with some stronger storms could get more than that. So enjoy tomorrow. It's going to be beautiful, mid-80s, plenty of sunshine, clouds rolling in later in the day. On our Friday, we have only 20% chance for Friday night football. Team 1-1 looks like for the most part will be dry. And then a 70% chance of showers and storms on our Saturday and on our Sunday. 30 to 40 million Americans are at risk of eviction due to the pandemic, and that is the estimate of one, non, uh, one nonpartisan study, families are struggling to pay the rent. A group rallied in DeKalb County today to protest what they claim are illegal evictions. Tracy Amick-Pierre tells us what protections are still in place to families safely in their homes. It is not properly maintained. It is not efficient. It is not safe. They have found three or more people here dead. Karen Williams lives at the Efficiency Lodge in Decatur, where Wednesday morning a group rallied against living conditions and evictions. 
like Valerie Hurston, whose sister lives there with her six children. To put somebody out during a pandemic, that's ridiculous. Hurston shared these pictures of what she calls unlivable conditions. Uh, plumbing is always stopped up. There's no carpet on the floor. There you have to have, for the AC, you have to have a bowl for it to leak. This place is filthy. We talked to Atlanta legal aid attorney John Ganey, who says the obligation of a landlord to make repairs is completely independent of the tenant's ability to pay rent. They're going to subject themselves to lawsuits um, you know, down the road if they don't do that in a timely manner. And while the CARES Act moratorium on evictions has expired, Ganey says another protection is now in place. Under a CDC order from September, residential evictions for most tenants due to non-payment should be paused until December 31st. That doesn't mean that rent is not accruing. That doesn't mean that the tenant won't have to pay rent. They'll have to pay rent for every single month that they're occupying the premises. It's just getting pushed back. Even if an eviction proceeding is already underway, Ganey says tenants can still protect themselves. He says they need to fill out a home renter declaration online and submit it to their landlord and the courts. We are in America. There's no reason for nobody to really be homeless, especially kids. We reached out to the owners of that lodge, but they did not respond. The body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Doctors at Emory want you to go ahead and start thinking about how your family will celebrate Halloween. Experts say there are safe ways to keep things fun and spooky for the kids. Here's Mara Sirianni. Well, this year you may not feel confident in sending your kids out to trick or treat or even to some of their favorite haunted attractions, but experts at Emory say there are ways that you can safely do some of these things. Emory University doctor Colleen Kraft says for starters, if you plan to host trick or treaters, use candy slides or grabber hooks to pass out candy. If your child wants to dress up, she says choose a masked costume, use food service gloves to go through your child's candy, set that bowl aside for at least a day to let any germs on the candy wrappers die, or take this opportunity to start a new tradition like a neighborhood trunk or treat. 
Dr. Kraft says unless an event like a haunted house specifically advertises precautions, it's probably best to avoid. I think if there's a haunted paths outside or something that um, is sort of been intentionally created to keep some of that social distance, uh, I think that those are okay. But I think if there's no indication that there's, they're thinking about the pandemic in the orchestration of the haunted house, I think those should be avoided. And Dr. Kraft says costume masks should work as long as they contain a cough or a sneeze. And if a costume doesn't require a mask, she definitely suggests incorporating one. What would 2020 be without some social media controversy? The Chinese-owned TikTok site might be shut down as tension with China continues to rise. Joining me is a man who knows about tension and a man who posts some of the most risque TikTok videos I've ever seen, <laughs> national columnist Ron Hart. Ron, what do you think about TikTok? Is it an enemy of the people here in the United States? To be fair, I just like them. I don't post them. Um, yeah, I think uh, there's some nefarious activity by the Chinese government around this TikTok thing. So there's a shotgun wedding between Oracle and Walmart and the Chinese uh, U.S. thing. So as a libertarian, I'm not a big fan of Trump doing that. It is very hard to live in the world in 2020 or 2021 if the United States and China are not getting along. I mean, this is not 1955 with the USSR. I mean, we are totally tied together uh, hand and foot economically. There, there's no escaping yeah. that. And that's probably why Walmart got involved in the TikTok deal, because they buy a lot of goods from China. So that needs to be rectified. I think we have a bad trade deal. Trump has pushed it. It may be to his detriment. This uh, virus is uh, still a lot to be told about the virus, where it came from. So that's, that's the story that will play out in the future, I think. The vice presidential debate happening tonight. I want to ask you about the plexiglass shield that will be used to protect the candidates. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, Kamala will be protected from Pence and perhaps COVID, and Pence will be protected from uh, Antifa and bricks being thrown at him. So, <laughs> Did you work on that line plans. all day? Is, was that line, that's prepared text, isn't it? No, I thought about when I went to the 7-Eleven today and checked out. <laughs> okay. Los Angeles, uh, very excited over the hillside Donald Trump sign over the 405 freeway and the 10-foot white letters at the Sunset Boulevard exit on Tuesday. Have, have you seen that in Southern California as of yet? Yeah, I've been out there a lot. Uh, you pull off Sunset Boulevard, you, you know, it's very dangerous there. Of course, the Trump sign is the most dangerous thing. But you also have OJ's house and you have the Charles Manson house. So there's a lot of danger in L.A. So all of Hollywood and all of Los Angeles wants to get Trump. They're going to get Trump or after him, they're going to get him. But I wouldn't worry too much. They, were, they weren't even able to get OJ out there. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. All right, Ron Hart, always thank you. Talk to you next Good week. Good to see you. Okay. We hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people, or are you doing this to make money, or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks.
Televised newscasts not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you. We the pandemic, protests, civil unrest, vandalism, property damage, Canceled events and closures all happening in downtown Atlanta about the same time. Bill Liss and Stephen Boise, who is one of the really talented photojournalists to ever work in the city, take an in-depth look at the heart of Atlanta, where it is, where it's going from here. For downtown Atlanta, the year started out with lots of promise. Hotels at 75% occupancy, 50,000 or more retailers expected at the August trade shows at America's Mart. The restaurants and the stores were thriving. Then. In March, COVID-19 set in and the bottom of downtown Atlanta fell out. The Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau reports that more than $10 billion in revenue has already been lost and 80% of Atlanta's downtown hospitality workers forced out of work. Atlanta City Council President Felicia Moore confronts the two basic issues confronting downtown. I believe COVID is one of the first considerations that people are having as to whether or not it's safe to go to hotels, safe to uh, go in places where they're gathering with a lot of people. And then on top of that, uh, particularly for our business owners in the downtown area and other business corridors, you know, when is the next protest? Is it going to result in more property damage and vandalism? That damage caused on May 29th and May 30th, when protesters over systematic racism and inequality ended with looting and vandalism. But downtown is fighting back. In the middle of the COVID-19 shutdowns and protests, Derek Hayes, owner of Big Dave's Cheesesteaks on Fourth Side Street, has been determined to get both his and other businesses up and running. I've been through, you know, two things when my windows got broke out, but. I understand that, you know, the community means everything to me, so I want nothing that, that, you know, letting that stop me from, you know, taking care of them, because without the community, I wouldn't be standing right now. Prior to that, I've given out um, $26,000 to help um, Black-owned businesses get back on their feet. I also, throughout the whole pandemic, I've been feeding frontline workers on hospital to hospital. And, um, I have took water boys off the streets to give them employment, you know, to help try to provide for their families. Also working hard to bring business back downtown is the CEO of Atlanta Cruiser City Tours, Stephen Chester. After a COVID shutdown, he started back up in May and is now running 12 of his 50 Segways and two of his five cars on downtown tours. He sees business coming back, slowly, but coming back. Well, all in all, we still are seeing people, whether they be locals or people just driving in or visiting Atlanta, are uh, pretty good on those weekends. So it is not the suit and tie guest that we've seen in the past. It is a younger demographic, some people who are probably more open to being out and open and around others. But both Hayes and Chester face a formidable reality. The big crowd, says the president of the Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau, William Pate, won't be back anytime soon. I mean, the end of the year is going to be bleak. I think you have to be honest about that. We've got uh, we only have two events left on the calendar, uh, the SEC Championship and uh, uh, Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. Currently, you would expect those would be played with no fans in the stands. But there is a ray of sunshine as Atlanta continues to battle COVID-19. It's from America's Mart. A major trade show in August tanked as only 20% of the 50,000 out-of-town buyers did show up. But now, a show set for October already has more than 4,000 registered. No problem. I was completely comfortable. But for many out-of-town buyers, like interior designer Teresa Davis of Denver, 
They say they have no intention of staying away from Atlanta or America's Mart. COVID doesn't bother me. Protests don't bother me. And because of my love at Atlanta, of Atlanta, I was thrilled to be there and had a wonderful time. And America's Mart senior marketing executive Dorothy Belshaw puts Atlanta and COVID-19 in perspective. So I would say that I think what we are experiencing in Atlanta is being experienced in many urban areas around the country. I think it's not specific to Atlanta. Central Atlanta Progress President A.J. Robinson, whose efforts center on downtown business, looks to next year. I think we're patiently, all patiently waiting on a vaccine. And uh, if you and I are talking a year from now, I think we'll be have a much better outlook about not only Atlanta, but all the urban cores around the country. With hotel occupancy in downtown Atlanta reported in April at a low of 10 percent and now coming back slowly to more than 30 percent in August and business coming back as well, there is hope. But the Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau reports this caution. 2019 levels are not expected to come back in downtown Atlanta until 2023. Wow, that is a, a staggering fact to hear. It is. Y you know, I have two thoughts as I was watching that. First of all, downtown Atlanta, even in the best of times, has been a difficult journey for this economic engine of Atlanta Metro. It just has. It's been a, a slow go. Thank goodness for Georgia State. What would downtown Atlanta look like without Georgia State and Mark Becker and, and, uh, and the decision to really claim so many of those buildings. And the second thought I had was Ted Turner. You know, there was a time in the 1990s when there was a big push to try to take the Atlanta Hawks to the suburbs, and then when the Thrashers came along to do the same, and it looked like maybe that was gonna happen until Ted Turner stood up and said, oh, oh no, I'm, I'm keeping everything in downtown Atlanta. I think sometimes Turner doesn't get the credit for that. I, I know he doesn't get the credit for it. Think about what downtown Atlanta would be without State Farm Arena. It also struck me how intertwined everything is down there without those games, without the concerts, without the schools in full session as they would normally be. What happens to the hotels, the restaurants, the attractions that are there? Oh, yeah. And we're all seeing the, the domino effect as a result yeah, of that. I, I'm, I guess I just sit here and I worry about downtown Atlanta, not, not only because of the pandemic, but just long term. I, I worry about what it looks like 10 years from today. I do. I, I don't worry about Midtown. I don't worry about some other places in Atlanta. But mid, but downtown Atlanta remains, you know, it has a unique set of challenges. Yeah. We're 11 Alive Storm trackers are continuing to track Hurricane Delta. It weakened considerably as it moved to the north of the Yucatan Peninsula, just right parallel to the coastline there, just wreaking havoc as it went along because it was a cat four at this time last night with 145 mile per hour winds, and now the winds are at 90 miles per hour. It actually dropped to 85 earlier this evening and now starting to slowly strengthen over the Gulf. And I think it's going to be more rapidly intensifying as it moves over the warm waters the next 48 hours. So you can see right now as a cat one very close to the Yucatan as it moves over those waters that are very warm with a lack of shear, we'll likely see it become a cat two tonight and continue to strengthen throughout tomorrow and into Friday and will be a major hurricane as it makes landfall on Friday again on the Louisiana coast. It's been battered so much this hurricane season. And again, it's southwestern Louisiana. At least that's the way it looks right now. Now, the track can still change. We're still about, oh, 36 to 40 hours out before it's going to be on approach here. And it will likely come in as a very strong storm, bringing in that storm surge as well as hurricane force winds. So hurricane watch is already in place along the Louisiana coast. We have tropical storm watches in the yellow there on each side. Storm surge a watch in place as well from High Island, Texas, all the way to Mobile Bay. And we could see a storm surge as high as nine feet above ground here in central Louisiana. So this is going to be very impactful for them along the Louisiana coast. And then as it moves inland, it should weaken pretty rapidly and become a remnant low by the time we get to the weekend. But it's going to bring a lot of moisture up and over North Georgia. So as it does so, we could see some pretty good showers and storms here this weekend. We'll time it out and let you know exactly what to expect coming up in just a few minutes. 
K9 Kate has been working hard sharing stories online during the pandemic, and here is one that we wanted to share with you during our newscast. Walker's story shows kindness can overcome cruelty. He is now healthy and happy and ready to find a forever home, but it took a lot of love and care to get him to this point. Walker was shot at least three times and found in Walker County, Georgia. He had to have one of his back legs amputated and Angels Among Us Pet Rescue nursed him back to health. He's now six years old, a 55 pound boxer mix who loves people, other dogs and car rides. We hope his happy ending will get even happier with a family soon, one that will pamper and spoil him for the rest of his life. You can follow Caitlin Ross on Facebook at K9 Kate. That's where you will find all of the latest news from 11 Alive's resident animal lover and advocate. This station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, President Trump back in the Oval Office today, despite fears that he may further spread COVID-19 through a White House staff already reeling from a series of infections. At the same time, Capitol Hill is sorting out where stimulus negotiations stand after mixed signals from the president. Alice Barr has the latest from Washington. A Marine guard today standing outside the West Wing of the White House, the first sign of what administration officials later confirmed. President Trump has broken his isolation and is back in the Oval Office, despite concerns about just how sick or contagious he might still be. The president continues to work. Uh, he's in uh, very good health. The president's chief of staff promised that safety measures were being taken to protect the huge numbers of people who work in the White House, which has suddenly become a coronavirus hotspot. 
hot spot. The White House physician saying today the president's vital signs are stable and quoting him as saying, I feel great. At the same time, confusion on both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue about another coronavirus stimulus package. After President Trump abruptly tweeted he was stopping negotiations with Democrats on Capitol Hill until after the election. That sent markets into a tailspin until the president tweeted again that he would support a standalone bill for stimulus checks to struggling Americans. Democrats have long opposed a piecemeal approach to economic recovery. All he has ever wanted in the negotiation was to send out a check with his name printed on it. And as the vice presidential candidates prepare to debate tonight in Salt Lake City, a high-stakes debate inside and out of the White House over whether President Trump will be healthy enough to face off against Joe Biden again next week in Miami. 11 Alive's voter access team dedicated to giving you everything you need to know about your ballot to make sure that it counts in November. If you have any questions or concerns, reach out to us. You can email us at whereatlspeaks at 11alive.com. You can text us directly at 404-885-7600. And you can find all of the resources you need over on 11alive.com slash vote or on the 11 Alive app. It's a good one. We have 11 Alive storm trackers. They're going to be tracking some big changes as we head into this weekend, much different than last weekend. Did you notice how fall-like and beautiful it was this past weekend? And the leaves are starting to change across much of North Georgia. Here in Franklin Mountain, no exception. You can see some of the reds and oranges here in the trees. Jason Bonner, one of our 11 Alive storm trackers, posting this picture today. His father took it after eye surgery with his one good eye. So we're sending best wishes to Jason's dad tonight. Thank you for that great picture. You did a great job with just one functioning eye. So we're looking at those low temperatures this morning that were down in the mid-40s in Blairsville. It's those cool night temperatures that helped to churn the these colors are so vibrant this time of year overnight. Uh, 52 in Rome, 53 in Carrollton, and our low this morning in Atlanta was 62 degrees. The afternoon highs making it into the low 80s today, and nice and mild and running several degrees above average all across North Georgia today. So overnight tonight, it'll be another lovely night. Very few clouds out there, a few high clouds starting to scoot in in the morning hours. And on our wasometer, in that scale of 1 to an 11, with 11 being a perfect day, a 10, just because we're going to be so unseasonably warm, but it will be a great day to get outside. It's just going to be a little on the warm side, so a 10 on the wasometer, plenty of sunshine with some afternoon clouds moving in. And we should should peak out in the mid 80s at around 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So a very nice day to get ready for some yucky weather over the weekend. So we're going to be unseasonably warm on Thursday. We'll see those clouds start to increase and then we'll be preparing for possible storms over the weekend. So it is going to be a busy weekend in the uh, 11 Alive Storm Tracker Center. So as we take a look at what we're expecting to see in terms of landfall, that's going to be on Friday. So starting in the morning and then just getting worse throughout the day along the Louisiana coast as this system moves in. This is Delta, of course. Heavy rain. It'll be a major hurricane upon landfall, bringing in squalls of rain, uh, a storm surge right now forecast to be up around nine feet in some spots in uh, of the Louisiana coastline and then moving inland and weakening rapidly as it moves inland. So we do expect to see it become a remnant low within a day or two of landfall and then bringing in a lot of moisture here. So by the time we get to the weekend, squalls of rain are possible. And then we'll have breaks in the action. But as these bands move through, that's when we could see strong to severe storms. So Sunday morning, widespread rain. We could be tracking thunderstorms on Sunday morning even. And then through the afternoon and evening as well, some of these storms moving in around that center of circulation. It's going to be up around northern Tennessee by the time we get to Sunday afternoon. But it'll still be drawing some of that rich moisture off the Gulf of Mexico. And then as we head into Monday afternoon, still some wraparound moisture affecting us for the start of the work week. So the rainfall amounts uh, will be heaviest in Louisiana and into Arkansas. There they could see oh, 7 to even 10 inches of rain. Here we're thinking 1 to 2 inches, but across northeast Georgia we may end up seeing a little bit more than that. We could be seeing some localized amounts, especially in higher elevations. They could be up around 3 plus inches. So we'll track those storms carefully. 
over the weekend for sure. So tomorrow's great. No problems there. A 10 on your risometer. Temperatures in the mid 80s. 20% chance late Friday. So I think most of our Friday night football games are going to be a okay, mostly dry. And then over the weekend, the storms move in. A 70% chance of showers and storms on our Saturday and Sunday. And then they start to taper off, but we still have a chance on Monday, a 30% chance, and then a 20% chance Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank police officer is being credited with saving the life of a homeless suspect. Body camera footage captured it all. Marta says, uh, Marta says Officer Keith Softly helped take down a suspect armed with a knife, and they say this all happened while the man was allegedly committing an aggravated assault. According to a Marta report, it all started when Officer Softly was flagged down by someone saying they were being chased by a man with a large knife. At first, Softly drew his gun, but the suspect identified as Martel Ivy complied with his commands to drop the knife and get on the ground. That's when Softly noticed the suspect was bleeding heavily from a cut on his arm and appeared to be losing consciousness. Officer Softly then put away his gun and started giving aid using a department issued tourniquet and working to keep Ivy conscious until more help arrived. Ivy was later taken to Emory Hospital. Now this case has been turned over to Decatur Police and Officer Softly might seem familiar to you, and it's for a good reason. He is no stranger to stepping in to help. Back in 2018, we told you about how he and fellow MARTA officers worked to try and save two different men who suffered heart attacks hours apart from each other at the same MARTA station. The officers used a defibrillator and CPR to help one of the men. Softly was later honored with a Red Cross Award for his quick thinking and the Officer of the Year Award from MARTA last year. 
19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. been the home of blockbusters like Avengers, Ant-Man, and the Wasp. Tonight, a major change is coming to Pinewood Studios in Fayette County. Its name is changing. The more than 700-acre production studio will now be known as Trilith uh, Tri Studios. The name change comes months after its owners unveiled plans for a massive expansion that is expected to be finished by 2022. The name of the community across the street from the studio is also being changed from Pinewood Forest to Trilith, so that is all new. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. All right, good evening, everyone. We're covering several big stories for you tonight, including a look at the Metro zip codes showing the highest number of COVID-19 cases. But with 27 days until the presidential election, we are turning first to voting here in Georgia. Early voting set to begin Monday in our state, and one of the largest polling venues in the country is expanding its operations. State Farm Arena was transformed into a Fulton County voting site during the summer's general primary runoff. Now it's tripling the number of voting machines from 100 to 300. It's also doubling the number of staff on site daily to help ensure the process is smooth and safe for everyone. Early voting runs through Friday, October 30th. We're trying to prevent twindemics of COVID plus influenza, which could be devastating. Dr. Kathleen Toomey with the Department of Public Health and Governor Brian Kemp today telling everyone to get that flu shot this year. Uh, in their first press conference together since early August, they stressed the presence of COVID-19 in our communities makes, it, makes getting the flu shot more important than ever. ever. And they also said more than 300,000 doses of the flu vaccine are available now and drive through clinics are an option this year as well. Dr. Toomey also revealed that uh, probable COVID-19 cases will be disclosed on the Department of Health's website, making our numbers more accurate. Now, these are cases that come from antigen tests or spit tests. 
Whenever someone has a positive antigen test, they often have to follow that up with a PCR test, which is more accurate. Now the state's plan is to report both of those tests separately, giving us a more accurate picture of our positivity rate and how widespread the virus is in our communities. We are still continuing to test, still encouraging people to get tested at our at our sites, but are also recognizing that many people choose to go to an urgent care center or some other place where they can get these rapid antigen tests. Governor Brian Kemp touting the excellent progress that Georgia is making as we work to bring down those numbers of COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations and deaths. So let's take a look at where we stand right now. Our new cases reported are down 64% from our peak on July 24th. This is the graphic that shows what the governor is talking about. These are Georgia's new cases over time. The dotted line is, is our curve. The peak at the top was July 24th with more than 4,700 new cases reported in a single day. Today, that number is down to 1,400. When we look at how that average has dropped over the past 10 weeks, we see a significant drop of more than 60%. But when we compare that to uh, May and June, today's average is higher. So we're not quite back where we should be, the levels that we saw prior to the summer surge. Currently, our confirmed hospitalizations for COVID patients stands at 1,287. That's down 60% from our peak. Governor Brian Kemp announcing similar progress in bringing down the number of people in the hospital from COVID. July 24th was also a peak on that date with more than 4,800 people so sick that they needed serious treatment. Well, today that number is stabilized. It has been around 1,300 for the past few weeks here. That's great news because it means there's space available to help take care of those severe cases out there. The one area we're still seeing much higher numbers than we'd like to see is deaths. At the height of the surge, the average was 72 deaths each and every day. Well, today that number is down closer to 30, but Georgia is still above the national average for the size of the state and the number of cases that we have. Georgia is making some progress in reducing the spread of COVID-19, but the latest White House Coronavirus Task Force report obtained by 11 Alive shows that Fulton, Gwinnett and DeKalb counties still have the highest number of new cases. We can see where the virus is spreading most when we look at zip code data. It's re released by the County Board of Health Departments in Fulton 30349 had the highest number of cases in the county. The increase is slowing down, but still reporting about 200 new cases in the past month. In early May, zip code 30044 around Lawrenceville only had 356 COVID cases. Here, cases are consistently rising week after week. Now the total is more than 3,800, making it the top zip code within the county. In DeKalb, Stone Mountain leads with the largest number of cases in zip code 30083. They've had more than 1,400 cases of the virus there. Before the summer surge, that number was 250. You know what? There's one study out there that shows that 30 to 40 million Americans are at risk of eviction because of the pandemic. Families are struggling to pay their rent. A group rallied in DeKalb County today to protest what they claim are illegal evictions. Tracy Amick Pierre tells us what protections are still in place for those families to stay in their homes. It is not properly maintained. It is not efficient. It is not safe. They have found three or more people here dead. Karen Williams lives at the Efficiency Lodge in Decatur, where Wednesday morning a group rallied against living conditions and evictions. Like Valerie Hurston, whose sister lives there with her six children. To put somebody out during a pandemic, that's ridiculous. Hurston shared these pictures of what she calls unlivable conditions. Uh, plumbing is always stopped up. There's no carpet on the floor. There you have to have, for the AC, you have to have a bowl for it to leak. This place is filthy. We talked to Atlanta legal aid attorney John Ganey, who says the obligation of a landlord to make repairs is completely independent of the tenant's ability to pay rent. They're going to subject themselves to lawsuits um, you know, down the road if they don't do that in a timely manner. And while the CARES Act moratorium on evictions has expired, Ganey says another protection is now in place. Under a CDC order from September, residential evictions for most tenants due to nonpayment should be paused until December 31st. 
That doesn't mean that rent is not accruing. That doesn't mean that the tenant won't have to pay rent. They'll have to pay rent for every single month that they're occupying the premises. It's just getting pushed back. Even if an eviction proceeding is already underway, Ganey says tenants can still protect themselves. He says they need to fill out a home renter declaration online and submit it to their landlord and the courts. We are in America. There's no reason for nobody to really be homeless, especially kids. You know, we, we reached out to the owners of the Efficiency Lodge, but they have not responded. It is an ongoing dilemma, an ongoing debate. How do we best educate students during a pandemic all the way from pre-K to college? College campuses have proven to present a challenge. We have seen images of large parties on campuses and students and parents are split. One side supporting an all virtual model or even sending students back home. The other side feels strongly about staying on campus, getting the experience they've paid for. Some experts say colleges and universities should be looking at harm reduction approaches that focus on making gatherings safe rather than banning them altogether. When it comes to college campuses and COVID-19, the blame game is in full gear. But are the rising number of cases the fault of school leadership or irresponsible college students? There is a big blame on college students, which I think rightfully so in some ways. Um, but I do see a lot of non-college students in the community not taking COVID seriously as well. Students across the country have been scolded, suspended, and called selfish by college leaders. And while students bear personal responsibility for their actions and for following school and public health guidelines, experts say blaming them for the situation is problematic. UGA elementary education student Emily Turner wishes there were safer options for students to gather, along with mental health considerations, understandable data and consequences for some students actions. I know a lot of people are kind of like on the wave of like closing campus and I don't think that that's the option that we need to go to because kids are still going to want social interaction, so that's just going to drive them more to go into the bars. Some health experts say students were set up to fail with unrealistic expectations for their behavior. Julia Marcus, a Harvard Med School infectious disease epidemiologist, told NBC News isolation isn't practical on college campuses. And the age group is primed to take risk, especially for students who have been isolated and away from friends for months. She says blaming students make them less likely to openly work with contact tracers, perhaps with fear of negative consequences on campus. Instead, experts say schools should explore harm reduction approaches, not outright bans, shifting the focus to making gatherings which will occur more safe. That means ideas like porch parties with social distancing and masks or outdoor beer pong. Some have praised ideas like chairs on the library lawn at the University of Notre Dame with fire pits and games outside. Marcus warns that so-called abstinence-only approaches to COVID-19, where things are flatly not allowed, will result in unintended results. She says there's a real need for compassion and creativity. Um, I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Um, you just heard me talking. I'm talking to our, uh, our Facebook Live audience right now. We have about 300 people on Facebook Live right now, and we are talking about the track of what we expect and the impacts that we potentially will see here um, with uh, what's going on with the storm Delta that is down into the uh, Gulf of Mexico right now. Let me get this back to the frame that I wanted to start off with with you guys. And you can see here what we're talking about. Uh, Delta is starting to gain strength once again. Uh, right now it moved over the Yucatan Peninsula earlier and made landfall around the Cozumel Cancun area and then uh, lost a little bit of strength, went back down to 85 miles an hour. Now it's strengthening again again with max winds of 90 miles an hour. And you can kind of see this getting a little better organized right here, moving up through the open water here of the Gulf of Mexico, and it's going to continue to strengthen a little bit more. Uh, take a look at what we're watching here. Let's take a look at this on the bigger picture, and you can see that it's a category one max winds 90 miles an hour. We think it'll become a category two pretty quickly and then um, up to a category three. We think by uh, Thursday night into Friday as it's getting closer to the Gulf Coast. However, uh, we think that will be kind of brief as a category three. It should come back down to a category two Friday afternoon before it makes landfall right here along the Louisiana coastline. 
continuing to move northward. Then again, we have to watch these remnants here. This is a tropical depression just north of Jackson Saturday afternoon and then Sunday the remnant low is up into Kentucky. So we have to watch this part right here from Saturday afternoon into Sunday afternoon for the better chance for showers, the potential for some winds and yes, maybe even the chance for some storms around. Stay with us. We'll talk more about those specific risks and what you need to be prepared for coming up in just a few minutes. All right, Chris, thank you. Today we saw workers putting up an eight foot security fence at the state capitol. We're told that this is just a trial to see which style of fence the state prefers before a more permanent barrier encircles the property. The Georgia Building Authority and the state public safety board say the fence means Georgia National Guard members won't have to help with security at night. Capitol Police and the state patrol are already assigned to the Capitol. They say the fence is part of security upgrades. The cost of the upgrades, though, is six mil, uh, five million dollars. It comes as state agencies were asked to cut 10% from their budgets because of the economic hit from the pandemic. Governor Brian Kemp listed public safety as a top concern when signing the fiscal budget for 2021. This budget prioritizes education, health care and public safety. It puts people over politics and it helps ensure a safer, stronger tomorrow for all Georgians. State Representative Scott Holcomb, a Democrat, says he does not support the fence around the Capitol. Critics say it sends the message, a wrong message, about the people's house. All right, straight ahead, the family of a man shot and killed by an Atlanta police officer continues to fight for justice more than a year later. Next, the new lawsuit filed by the family of Jimmy Atchison. And don't forget, we're streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe and join that conversation in the community section. We got more 11 Alive news, prime time after the break. Sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Welcome back, everyone. Tonight, the family of a man shot and killed by an Atlanta police officer last year is now filing a civil lawsuit. Uh, the lawsuit alleges serious violations that led to the death of 21 year old Jimmy Atchison. He was shot in the back while Atlanta police and the FBI were serving a search warrant at an apartment. And according to the family, an investigation by GBI indicated that Atchison was given conflicting commands by officers in that room. The officer shot Atchison, sung Kim retired from the force shortly after this incident. No one has been charged in connection with his death. And last year, Atchison's family filed a civil lawsuit against the FBI and the city of Atlanta for $20 million. Coming up a little later tonight on Uplate, our sister station over on 11 Alive, we're going to hear from the Atchison family attorney. President Trump ended stimulus talks this week, but supports some measures like helping airlines, something the industry is desperate for as they lay off thousands of workers. Pete Munitin has a chance to hear from some of those who are impacted. As all of you know, the airline industry has been impacted greatly by this global pandemic. One flight attendant, Brianna Ross, addressed the passengers of her American Airlines flight. She didn't expect to leave them with a tearful goodbye. For myself and one of the crew members on our flight today, this means we'll be furloughed October 1st. 
and unfortunately this was my last working flight before that day comes. Airlines say they will recall Ross and the roughly 50,000 workers they cut last week, but only if they get $25 billion in a new stimulus bill. New tweets from President Trump have thrown a deal into disarray. It's the latest breakdown in talks with House Democrats that airlines call disheartening. People see numbers on TV, but we are real people that are really struggling right now. Ross says she's living on savings from her last few months on the job. Just furloughed workers say new federal help is their best hope. 8,000 flight attendants at American Airlines alone are now looking for jobs. It's been a roller coaster. It's, we've been high, we've been low, we've been on the, this verge of making this happen for so long and then for it to all just fall apart. In a new letter, airline unions are urging Congress to pass a standalone stimulus for airlines. President Trump tweeted his support, but House leaders stressed the bill failed in the Senate. Airline unions say lawmakers must end this stimulus standoff with workers caught in the middle. These are people who have been on the front lines since the beginning of this virus. Fighting is cruel and it's got to be reversed. It's important to remember that not all airlines are being impacted in the same way. Delta and Southwest say they are raising their own money and don't need government loans. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Tracker, still chatting with about over 300 people on Facebook Live right now, uh, talking about what to expect with uh, the rain. Uh, we had a few people ask, what do you think is, uh, you know, will it rain the entire time for the Georgia game on Saturday? You know, I don't think it's going to be a downpour all day long on Saturday. We will have showers off and on, but there will be some dry times too. It's just going to be periods of rain coming through. Here's a look at these temperatures around North Georgia right now, 72 in Atlanta, but we do have some cooler air outside the city, 62 now in Carrollton, uh, mid 60s in Peachtree City, lower 60s in Covington, upper 60s in Athens, more 60s up here on the north side. Uh, take a look at what we're going to be watching as we go through the rest of the evening hours tonight and it's going to be pretty comfortable out there. We're going to watch those temperatures as they fall. They're in the 60s now. We're going to be falling uh, or lower 70s in Atlanta now, then falling into those 60s uh, for the rest of the evening hours. And then overnight we drop down into the 50s for our low temperatures here. Uh, so it's going to be a nice, you know, comfortable morning. And then we watch those temperatures rising again and we'll see some sunshine mixing in with a few clouds at times during the day. So for your Thursday, we're going to go ahead and go with a 10 on the wasometer. That's our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. Highs near 85. It's going to be warm, warmer than we had today when we got up to 83 degrees. It'll be 85 tomorrow, which is above average by about 9 degrees. So that's why it's not a perfect 10. We'll also have just a couple of clouds that will be mixing in at times. All right, let me show you what we're watching with our weather over the next couple of days here and any uh, any um, you know original or preliminary impacts that we're going to be having from Delta as it moves in or early impacts there. Tomorrow we're going to be fine. Just a few clouds will mix in with the sunshine at times. Beginning to see a little moisture though that'll be spreading in along the Gulf Coast region. Uh, Friday dry in the morning and I really think it's going to be a dry for the big part of the day here on Friday, but more clouds are going to be building in. Here you see Delta making landfall during the afternoon hours on Friday. Most of that heavy rain and tropical rain is going to be along with that area of low pressure. Saturday morning, heaviest rain with those bands are going to be over into Louisiana, Arkansas, moving into Mississippi. We'll have scattered showers here, all right? So watch here on Saturday, off and on periods of rain during the day. But at the same time, watch the storm that's moving up, and you occasionally see these bands coming out of that, and sometimes these outer bands here could have some pockets of heavy rain and we'll be watching late Saturday for not only just that rain, but also the potential for some storms. It's too early to tell exactly what type of impacts we would have for some of the storms. I really think that the tornado risk is going to be on the low end. Here you see the storm crossed over the Yucatan, now back over the Gulf of Mexico. It's gaining strength again. Max winds back up to 90 miles an hour. We think it'd be back up to a category three by uh, Thursday night into, into early Friday, maybe back to a two as it makes landfall uh, in Friday afternoon. And then, you know, losing its strength as a uh, tropical depression, then a remnant low from Saturday into Sunday. And right here along that track, we're on the right hand side side, so it's going to be in that time frame from Saturday later into Sunday when we're going to see those better chances for the rain and the storm risk. Here you can see that on Saturday, and there you see as it moves up toward the north, uh, showers here on Sunday as well before things start to taper off a little bit more as we get into your Monday. So 
This could still change uh, based on that track there, but based on what we're seeing right now, partly cloudy Thursday, a high of 85, only a 20% chance for a shower Friday, but uh, clouds increasing. Better rain chances Saturday into Sunday, the potential for some storms possible too. Breezes as well, 10 to 20 miles an hour for Saturday into Sunday. Then decreasing rain chances Monday, much lower rain chances Tuesday and Wednesday at 20%, cooling down to the mid 70s again by the middle of the week. All right, thanks a lot, Chris. You know, doctors at Emory want you to start thinking about how your family is going to celebrate Halloween. Experts say there are safe ways to keep things fun and spooky for the kids. Mara Seriani has more. Well, this year you may not feel confident in sending your kids out to trick or treat or even to some of their favorite haunted attractions, but experts at Emory say there are ways that you can safely do some of these things. Emory University doctor Colleen Kraft says for starters, if you plan to host trick or treaters, use candy slides or grabber hooks to pass out candy. If your child wants to dress up, she says choose a masked costume. Use food service gloves to go through your child's candy. Set that bowl aside for at least a day to let any germs on the candy wrappers die. Or take this opportunity to start a new tradition like a neighborhood trunk or treat. Dr. Kraft says unless an event like a haunted house specifically advertises precautions, it's probably best to avoid. I think if there's a haunted paths outside or something that um, is sort of been intentionally created to keep some of that social distance, uh, I think that those are okay. But I think if there's no indication that there's, they're thinking about the pandemic in the orchestration of the haunted house, I think those should be avoided. And Dr. Kraft says costume masks should work as long as they contain a cough or a sneeze. And if a costume doesn't require a mask, she definitely suggests incorporating one. You know, Jennifer, I think that would work because if you're already wearing the mask, right? The COVID-19 mask, you're doing that already as a young kid. Then you put the other scary mask over that or maybe superhero mask. You would think that it would keep the kids safe. Yeah, we've heard some different information though. We've also heard that maybe they should just kind of stick with the regular mask that they would be normally wearing. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it just depends because if you have like a plastic one on, then that might not do as much. You know, they've got the little holes in them. So yeah. uh, certainly something to go ahead and as they said, start thinking about in advance so you can be ready and not be scrounging around for those last minute costumes and safety precautions. Good advice. Sure. Yeah. All right, so to come, the Braves with a chance to take a commanding 2 nothing lead against the Marlins. Highlights and reaction from the Houston bubble next in primetime. Bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house clean? Second game of the NLDS where the Braves could take a 2-0 lead over the Marlins. Rookie Ian Anderson on the hill for his second postseason appearance ever in the big leagues. Anderson was sensational. The 22-year-old tossed five and two-thirds innings of shutout baseball. Eight strikeouts today for 17 total in the postseason. He has yet to allow a run. Bottom of the second, Dansby Swanson gets all of that one. A solo shot, second homer of the series for Swanson. 1-0 Atlanta. Bottom of the fourth, Travis Darno goes deep as well. This baseball making a dent out in the wall. 2-0 Atlanta. Braves win it to zip to take a commanding 2-0 lead in the series. Atlanta still undefeated in the postseason. Just credit goes to the, obviously the pitchers and you know the guy putting the numbers down has done an unbelievable job. Travis has been got to give him credit Seven too because there's there not a whole lot of shaking going and on and the game plan has been good and you can have a game plan all you want but if you can't execute it then it's it's not worth the paper it's written on. All right, so the Braves go for the sweep tomorrow. Cal Wright will get the start. We are rooting for them that's all right, the way. That's right. The Bravos got the got the got the broom out. Yeah, sweep there it out. We go. <laughs> You know, hybrid learning is a model for some schools like ones in Kansas. Jordan Betts explains how this is impacting students and teachers alike. Here's work to look at and analyze. Students are back learning in person in North Kansas City. What else do we see? The district is almost one month into their hybrid learning. Students splitting up their time between learning at home and at school. But 25% of students are fully virtual. We are prepping a lesson that we're going to teach in person and we're creating it all digitally. So we're typing out directions, we're making videos of lessons, videos of directions. Even though we identify the point of view. To help limit the spread of COVID-19, the district is limiting the movement of students. Here at Gateway, only teachers move classrooms. The kids do stay, but I as the teacher actually have to move. And um, I have to move to my teaching partner's room twice a day mm -hmm. and then work with her students at their assigned seats. With other districts like Shawnee Mission moving to hybrid models for some students. These North Kansas City educators have some advice. Give yourself and give your students grace. We are all learning something new. We are all trying our best um, and we just have to remember why we do it. I had a kid message me at like 930 last night and was like, can you please respond? I have a question and it killed me and I was like, oh, this is so hard, but setting aside time for yourself, you need to have some time at home. You don't need to be working at 10 o'clock at night. Click on today's work. It's a whole new normal for everyone, but teachers in the North Kansas City School District say they want to make pandemic learning enjoyable as possible. But they will 100% remember the sixth grade year with me. And so I just want to try my best to make it a year that they look back on and they don't think, Oh my gosh, that was terrible. That was so hard that they really see how we we all worked together and tried new things and, you know, made it memorable and made it fun. All right, coming up next with everything going on, we're going to take a closer look at the heart of Atlanta, where it is and where it's going from here. Of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
in times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of rest. The pandemic, protest and civil unrest, vandalism and property damage, canceled events and closures all happening in downtown Atlanta at the same time. 11 Alive's Bill Liss and photojournalist Stephen Boise take an in-depth look at the heart of Atlanta, where it is and where it's going from here. For downtown Atlanta, the year started out with lots of promise. Hotels at 75% occupancy, 50,000 or more retailers expected at the August trade shows at America's Mart. The restaurants and the stores were thriving. Then, in March, COVID-19 set in and the bottom of downtown Atlanta fell out. The Atlantic Convention and Visitors Bureau reports that more than $10 billion in revenue has already been lost and 80% of Atlanta's downtown hospitality workers forced out of work. Atlanta City Council President Felicia Moore confronts the two basic issues confronting downtown. I believe COVID is one of the first considerations that people are having as to whether or not it's safe to go to hotels, safe to uh, go in places where they're gathering with a lot of people. And then on top of that, uh, particularly for our business owners in the downtown area and other business corridors, you know, when is the next protest? Is it going to result in more property damage and vandalism? That damage caused on May 29th and May 30th, when protesters over systematic racism and inequality ended with looting and vandalism. But downtown is fighting back. In the middle of the COVID-19 shutdowns and protests, Derek Hayes, owner of Big Dave's Cheesesteaks on Forsyth Street, has been determined to get both his and other businesses up and running. I've been through, you know, two things when my windows got broke out, but I understand that, you know, the community means everything to me, so I want nothing that, you know, letting that stop me from, you know, taking care of them, because without the community, I wouldn't be standing right now. Prior to that, I've given out um, $26,000 to help um, Black-owned businesses get back on their feet. I also, throughout the whole pandemic, I've been feeding frontline workers on hospital to hospital. And, um, I have took water boys off the streets to give them employment, you know, to help try to provide for their families. Also working hard to bring business back downtown is the CEO of Atlanta Cruiser City Tours, Stephen Chester. After a COVID shutdown, he started back up in May and is now running 12 of his 50 Segways and two of his five cars on downtown tours. He sees business coming back slowly but coming back all in all we still are seeing people whether they be locals or people just driving in or visiting atlanta are pretty good on those weekends so it is not the suit and tie guests that we've seen in the past it is a younger demographic some people who are probably more open to being out and open and around others but both hayes and chester face a formidable reality the big crowd says the president of the atlanta convention and visitors bureau william pate won't be back anytime soon. I mean, the end of the year is going to be bleak. I think you have to be honest about that. We've got, uh, we only have two events left on the calendar, uh, the SEC Championship and uh, uh, Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. Currently, you would expect those would be played with no fans in the stands. But there is a ray of sunshine as Atlanta continues to battle COVID-19. It's from America's Mart. A major trade show in August tanked as only 20% of the 50,000 out of town buyers did show up. But now, a show set for October already has more than 4,000 registered. 
No problem. I was completely comfortable. But for many out-of-town buyers, like interior designer Teresa Davis of Denver, they say they have no intention of staying away from Atlanta or America's Mart. COVID doesn't bother me. Protests don't bother me. And because of my love at Atlanta, of Atlanta, I was thrilled to be there and had a wonderful time. And America's Mart senior marketing executive, Dorothy Belshaw, puts Atlanta and COVID-19 in perspective. So I would say that I think what we are experiencing in Atlanta is being experienced in many urban areas around the country. I think it's not specific to Atlanta. Central Atlanta Progress President A.J. Robinson, whose efforts center on downtown business, looks to next year. I think we're patiently, all patiently waiting on a vaccine. And uh, if you and I are talking a year from now, I think we'll be have a much better outlook about not only Atlanta, but all the urban cores around the country. With hotel occupancy in downtown Atlanta reported in April at a low of 10 percent and now coming back slowly to more than 30 percent in August and business coming back as well, there is hope. But the Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau reports this caution. 2019 levels are not expected to come back in downtown Atlanta until 2023. And you know what, uh, Jennifer, I may be aging myself, but I'm a kid of the 60s and uh, born and raised in Oakland, California, saw rioting, Black Panther Party lived. We just lived like three blocks away from the Black Panther Party, saw rioting in Berkeley as well. Took years to rebuild some of those communities, but Atlanta appears to be so resilient that I can see them making a comeback a lot quicker. Yeah, and hopefully that's something that we see all over the, the country because uh, I was talking about this story earlier and it, it really helps you to, to visualize and better understand how intertwined everything is without the, the sports going on, without mm. the different events, the yeah. games, the colleges, everything just really plays a part in the restaurants, the hotels, the attractions that are all down there. And you know, when some of those pieces fall, this is what we see happen. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see how things unfold this fall and going into 2021. Of course, we hope for the best. Yeah. Hey, K9 Kate has been working really hard, folks, sharing stories online during the pandemic. Here's one we want to share with you on the show. Walker's story shows kindness can overcome cruelty. He is now healthy, happy, and ready to find a forever home. There he is. It took a lot of love and care to get him to this point right here. Walker was shot at least three times and found in Walker County, Georgia. He had to have one of his back legs amputated. Angels Among Us Pet Rescue nursed him back to health, and he deserves to be spoiled and pampered for the rest of his life. He is six years old, a 55-pound boxer mix who loves people, other dogs, and car rides as well. He probably sticks his head out the car window and let his tongue just fly everywhere, right? And we're hoping his happy ending will be even happier with a family very soon. And you can follow Caitlin Ross on her Facebook page, K9 Kate, and uh, get more news and 11 Alive's residential animal lover and advocate. 11 Alive storm trackers continue to watch Hurricane Delta that weakened a little bit when it moved over the Yucatan Peninsula after landfall today. It went back down to about 85 mile an hour winds as it was moving back out over water. Now it's increasing again uh, to 90 mile an hour winds and we expect that strengthening process to continue as it's out over open water for a while. Here's a look at the latest on the uh, watches and the warnings. In fact, we have just watches right now. The yellow that goes on the, uh, the uh, eastern part of the Louisiana coastline up toward New Orleans. Orleans is where we have a tropical storm watch also over here near Houston on the Texas coastline and then to the uh, east of Houston and including much of the Louisiana coastline. That's where we have a uh, hurricane watch that is in effect. Those are most likely going to be upgraded to warnings pretty soon. Here's a look at the possible impacts here from Hurricane Delta. Now we're going to be talking about the remnants moving in through the southeast and coming uh, through parts of Mississippi and up into Tennessee and then into Kentucky. We're on the right hand side of that track. So we're still going to have rain, maybe one to two inches of that over the weekend. Higher amounts up in parts of North Georgia. Uh, the wind is going to be about 10 to 20 miles an hour at times possible. Nothing really out of the ordinary. We're just talking about some breezy conditions and maybe an occasional higher gust. We'll also be watching 
you know, we're going to be pretty far to the east of the actual area of low pressure, but there is the potential we could see some outer bands from that uh, that have some strong storms with them. Even though we don't think that's going to be widespread, we have a low risk of some stronger thunderstorms, maybe even some brief spin up tornadoes, but I really think that risk is going to be on the lower end. Stay with us. We'll keep talking about the, those impacts and what to expect, and we'll have more on the timeline for you coming up in just a few minutes. All right, Chris, thank you. Time now for some other big headlines making news across the country today. Facebook and Instagram now taking a big step to get rid of disinformation on social media ahead of the November election. The tech giant announced it's removing all accounts associated with the white wing conspiracy theory known as QAnon. The conspiracy campaign claims that big name Democrats, Hollywood stars and the mega rich are actually child trafficking pedophiles who kill children in satanic rituals. Facebook says it will largely rely on users to report the content for removal. The former Minneapolis police officer awaiting the trial in the murder of George Floyd was released on bond today. Derek Chauvin was released from the Minnesota Correctional Facility this morning, then transferred to the Hennepin County Jail, where he then posted a $1 million bond. Floyd died on May 25th after Chauvin pressed his knee against Floyd's neck while Floyd was handcuffed. Now all four officers charged in the case have been released on bond. This afternoon, Louisville police released files related to the internal investigation of the deadly shooting of Breonna Taylor. The files include several different documents and recordings, including officers' body camera videos from that night. This comes a week after the release of grand jury recordings and of jurors discussing those files. Well, do you plan to vote by mail? Now more than ever, more people are voting this way because of COVID-19. So how safe is the absentee ballot system in the United States? Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only.
We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continue. secure if you choose to send it by mail with a lot more people out there voting absentee because of the COVID-19. There are more questions than ever about election security and potential fraud. So how safe is the absentee ballot system in the United States? David Schechter takes a look at the facts. Is voting by mail secure? Politicians, experts, and probably all of your neighbors are talking about mail-in voting and whether or not it's a safe and effective way to vote. Voting by mail began during the Civil War when both Union and Confederate soldiers could cast ballots in their home states from their distant battlefields. It's been sort of part and parcel of elections we've, we've for a very long time, especially uniform and overseas voters. That allowed and opened the door for really a lot of expansions in regular voters moving to vote by mail. Voting by mail has since come a long way, accounting for 25% of total votes in 2016. Currently, five states have mail-in voting for all elections. Opponents of mail-in voting point to double counting or voting on behalf of deceased people. But a recent Washington Post study of three vote by mail states found just 372 possible cases where this happened. That's a fraction of the 14.6 million votes cast by mail in the 2016 and 2018 general elections. Fraud certainly is possible, but it's not nearly as widespread as some make it out to be. There's this constant tension in election administration right between security and access. So the more accessible we make the system, you know, the more opportunity there is for fraud. I don't think it is widespread. I don't think there is massive amounts of mail fraud going on, but to say there's no fraud in the system is also you know, disingenuous. As far as the large scale foreign attempts at vote by mail fraud, the FBI have recently stated that they have not seen a coordinated fraud effort and noted how difficult such an effort would be considering the decentralized nature of U.S. elections. However, Professor Atkinson does believe the rush to expand mail-in voting this year could make the system more vulnerable. So this really shift things in a way that's it's not typical. And so, you know, we, we're going to expect later ballots. Look, we've seen that, you know, many ballots in these places have gone uncounted. There's been delivery problems of ballots to the voter as well as back to the election official. So, you know, in states that have this down, it's not a problem, but in states that aren't used to it, it's, it's really a big change. Even with those concerns, Professor Atkinson believes mail-in voting is a good option this year due to COVID-19. The circumstances are such that, you know, we should all vote by mail as much as possible. I mean, the, the system is, is very strong, really. Election officials, you know, work to make sure there's integrity to the system. We have to look at this as a, a, a single moment where we have to bend our system because of the circumstances and then we need to go back and let states evolve naturally into processes that make sense for their voters. 11 Allies voter access team is dedicated to giving you everything you need to make sure your ballot counts this November. If you have any questions or concerns, reach out to us. You can email us at where Atlanta speaks at 11 alive.com. Text us directly. There's a number on the screen 404-885-7600. And you can find all the resources you need over on 11alive.com slash vote or on the 11 Alive app. We continue to track what's happening with Hurricane Delta getting a little stronger now that it's moved over the Yucatan Peninsula. It's gotten away from the landmass that caused it to weaken a little bit. But now that it's over water, it's strengthening again with maximum sustained winds back up to about 90 miles an hour. And this is a storm that's going to continue to strengthen over the open waters here of the Gulf. And then eventually we expect a landfall on Friday around the Louisiana coastline. Then we have to watch those remnants very closely as they move into our area later in the day here on um, or into the weekend with that rain chance it's going to be going up. So take a look at what we're watching. Here's the specific track. It does go back up to a category two uh, during the uh, overnight hours and then or in the afternoon still a category two tomorrow and then becoming a category three we think late Thursday into early on Friday and then landfall we expect on Friday afternoon. It could go back down to a category two. It might experience a little bit of shear here uh, right along the coastline and weaken just a little bit. 
as it moves inland. And then we'll continue watching this as it moves up toward the north as a uh, tropical depression right near the Arkansas Louisiana line moves up into Tennessee and then in Kentucky as a remnant low. So this period here from, you know, Saturday in the Sunday, as this is traveling in this direction, we're going to be on that right hand side of it where yes, we're going to have some rain. We have the potential for some breezes and maybe even some storms. Now let me show you this track. This is uh, this is on Saturday morning as it's already moved inland here. The main tropical moisture and heavy rain is going to be closer to the center of that storm, but we will have showers here that are going to be off and on during the day on Saturday and then into Sunday or late Saturday. We watch these bands and occasionally we might see some bands of heavier rain that swing through the metro area that could have some thunder and lightning with it. Right now we think the severe weather threat is going to be on the low end. Saturday night and into Sunday, there's that possibility as well for some of those bands to roll through. By Sunday, as this moves on up into parts of Kentucky, we're going to see just still some general showers here. I think the uh, the threat for stronger storms will be diminishing and still those uh, winds will start to die down a little bit and we'll really just see some breezes around 10 miles an hour. We think here's a specific look at that wind forecast. Look at that. The strong winds as the uh, center moves in on Friday. On Saturday, the blue colors that you see right here, they're just showing winds of about 10, maybe up to 20 miles an hour at times. Those stronger winds are going to be more over to the west. And then still, the blue colors with those 10 mile an hour winds, maybe some higher gusts at times, 10 to 20 mile an hour winds into Sunday before things calm down going into Monday. And then as far as the rain threat, that heavier, <coughs> excuse me, rainfall amounts, those are going to be over more toward the actual center of that low pressure. We're going to have about one to two inches of rain possible here, maybe some locally uh, higher amounts. So you can see the uh, rain chances don't really come in here really until Saturday. We just have a low risk Friday and then 70% chance for showers and storms Saturday into Sunday. Lower rain chances Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday down to a 20% chance with cooler air by Wednesday. A MARTA police officer is being credited with saving the life of a homeless suspect. Body camera footage captured it all. MARTA says Officer Keith Softly helped take down a suspect armed with a knife, and they say this all happened while the man was allegedly committing an aggravated assault. According to a MARTA report, it all started when Officer Softly was flagged down by someone saying they were being chased by a man with a large knife. At first, Softly drew his gun, but the suspect identified as Martel Ivy complied with commands to drop the knife and get on the ground. That's when Officer Softly noticed the suspect was bleeding heavily from a cut on his arm and appeared to be losing consciousness. Officer Softly then put away his gun and started giving aid using mm -hmm. a department issued tourniquet and working to keep Ivy conscious until more help arrived. Ivy was later taken to Emory Hospital. Now this case has been turned over to Decatur Police and Officer Softly might seem familiar to you, and if he does, it's for a good reason. He is no stranger to stepping in to help. Back in 2018, that's where this video is from, we told you about how he and fellow martyr officers worked to try and save two different men who suffered heart attack wow. hours apart from each other at the same martyr station. The officers used a defibrillator and CPR to help one of the men. Softly was later honored with a Red Cross Award for his quick thinking and as the Officer of the Year uh, for MARTA last year. Teen coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Prime Time, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
in times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19. UJ fans will see some changes at this weekend's game against Tennessee. And this all comes after the university reported more than 20,000 fans went to last Saturday's home opener. But how the students were seated, many without masks, raised concerns over social distancing. Brittany Kleinpleter explains the changes you can expect on Saturday. People have been talking about the UGA versus Auburn game since Saturday, but much of the focus was on what happened off of the field. ESPN cameras captured some students who were maskless or not social distancing. We all just kind of scream. We're like, oh my goodness, no one's wearing a mask and they're all really close together. Although university officials say the majority of fans wore masks and followed social distancing guidelines, they did admit the student section concerned them. That's why fans will see changes ahead of Saturday's home game against Tennessee. Student seating will be redistributed to allow more space between seats. An athletics department official says additional staff in the student section will also enforce social distancing rules. The expected changes have drawn mixed reactions from students. Uh, ask for something that's not going to happen. I don't think it'll change anything. I think I'm going to go see how it ends up watching TV live for the whole game. And if it looks much better, then I might consider it because my friends and I, we really want to go. And game day, it's really exciting here on campus. I don't really think they have that much to worry about. But again, it's a pandemic and you want to keep people safe and the liability issue. UGA is organizing seats together by pods, which includes four people sitting together per pod. They say they are also following all SEC guidelines. The policy requires fans to wear their mask inside of the stadium, but they can take it off once they are seated. We continue with more weather and headlines in just a few moments. Don't go anywhere. to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. The family of a man shot and killed by an Atlanta police officer continues to fight for justice more than a year later. Tonight, the new lawsuit filed by the family of Jimmy Atchison. Claims of illegal evictions, one group says they are being thrown out of their home during a pandemic, despite safeguards in place to prevent that. Plus, UGA received criticism about a crowded football game amid the pandemic. The extra safety precautions the university is now taking. Happening right now on this Wednesday night at 10 o'clock, a live look from Salt Lake City, Utah, the first and only vice presidential debate. Vice President Mike Pence and California Democratic Senator Kamala Harris are facing off at the University of Utah in what's called the benches area of Salt Lake City. Both candidates are divided by plexiglass and sitting 12 feet apart as extra COVID-19 precautions after the president's diagnosis. All of this, the moderator jumped right in with a question about the pandemic. We were able to reinvent testing. More than 115 million tests have been done to date. We were able to see to the delivery of billions of supplies so our doctors and nurses had the resources support they needed and we began really before the month of february was our to develop a vaccine and to develop medicines and therapeutics that have been saving lives all along the way and under president trump's leadership operation warp speed we believe we'll have literally tens of millions of doses of a vaccine before the end of this year uh, whatever the vice president is claiming the administration has done clearly it hasn't worked when you're looking at over 210,000 dead bodies in our country, American lives that have been lost, families that are grieving that loss. And you know, the vice president is the head of the task force and knew on January 28th how serious this was. And then thanks to Bob Woodward, we learned that they knew about it. And then when that was exposed, the vice president said, when asked, well, why didn't y'all tell anybody? He said, because the president wanted people to remain calm. We are going to have more on the debate coming up on Up Late on our sister station, 11 Alive. That's coming up in about 58 minutes. This is the aftermath of Hurricane Delta in Mexico. 260,000 people are without power in Cancun after the storm made landfall. It weakened a bit, but now is moving toward the Gulf Coast. Chris Holcomb joins us now, our chief meteorologist, with the timeline here and what sort of impact are, are we going to be looking at in Atlanta Metro? You know, and that brief weakening took place as it was encountering land with the first landfall. That was right there, as you mentioned, near Cancun and Cozumel, moving over the Yucatan Peninsula. So it was over land for a little bit. It weakened with winds that went back down to about 80, 85 miles an hour. Now that it's over water, uh, the wind speeds are picking up again. It's 90 mile an hour winds. And we're going to get another advisory in with in the hour. Uh, and I think that we'll see those winds even higher when we get the 11 o'clock advisory in. So here's the latest forecast track on this. It, it is going to continue that strengthening process to a category two overnight and through the day tomorrow and then back up to a three 
Thursday night into Friday, and it may experience a little bit of shear before it makes landfall on Friday afternoon. It could come back down to a category two, and then we'll keep watching the remnants as that moves inland here. This track has shifted just a little bit to the west, and that's going to push that heavier rain and the storm threat more over to the west of us. But we still have to watch Saturday into Sunday in this track right here. Since we're on that right hand side, that's going to be the time frame when we're going to see our best chances for rain, maybe some breezes and maybe even a low storm risk as well. We're going to talk more about that in just a few minutes. We're trying to prevent twin demics of COVID plus influenza, which could be devastating. Dr. Kathleen Toomey with the Department of Public Health and Governor Kemp today telling everyone to get their flu shot this year. It was their first news conference together since early August. They stressed that the presence of COVID-19 in Georgia communities makes getting a flu shot ever more important. They also said more than 300,000 doses of flu vaccine are available and drive through clinics are an option this year as well. Dr. Toomey revealed that probable COVID-19 cases will be disclosed on the Department of Health website, making our numbers more accurate. These are cases that come from antigen tests or what's known as a spit test. Whenever somebody has a positive antigen test, they often have to follow with the, uh, the APCR test, which is more ap accurate. The state's plan now is to report both of those tests separately, giving us a, a more accurate picture of the positivity rate and how widespread the virus is in our communities. We are still continuing to test, still encouraging people to get tested at our, at our sites, but are also recognizing that many people choose to go to an urgent care center or some other place where they can get these rapid antigen tests. Georgia is making some progress in reducing the spread of COVID-19, but the latest White House Coronavirus Task Force report obtained by 11 Alive shows that Fulton, Gwinnett and DeKalb still have the highest numbers of new cases. We can see where the virus is spreading most. When we look at zip code data, it is released by the County Board of Health Departments. In Fulton, 30349 had the highest number of cases in the county. The increase is slowing down, but still reporting about 200 new cases in the past month. In early May, zip code 30044 around Lawrenceville only had 356 cases. Now, cases are, are constantly rising there week after week. Now, the total is more than 3,800, making it the top zip area within the county. In DeKalb, Stone Mountain leads with the largest number of cases in zip code 30083. They have had more than 1,400 cases of the virus there. And before the summer surge, that number was just 250. We keep track of the very latest COVID-19 numbers and trends every day. We even break it down county by county. You can find it all in the coronavirus special section on 11alive.com or the 11alive app. 30 to 40 million Americans are at risk of eviction due to the pandemic, and that is the estimate of one nonpartisan study. Families are struggling to pay the rent. A group rallied in DeKalb County today to protest what they claim are illegal evictions. Here's Tracy A. McPeer to tell us what protections are still in place to families to try to keep them in their homes. It is not properly maintained. It is not efficient. It is not safe. They have found three or more people here dead. Karen Williams lives at the Efficiency Lodge in Decatur, where Wednesday morning a group rallied against living conditions and evictions. Like Valerie Hurston, whose sister lives there with her six children. To put somebody out during a pandemic, that's ridiculous. Hurston shared these pictures of what she calls unlivable conditions. Uh, plumbing is always stopped up. There's no carpet on the floor. There you have to have, for the AC, you have to have a bowl for it to leak. This place is filthy. We talked to Atlanta legal aid attorney John Ganey, who says the obligation of a landlord to make repairs is completely independent of the tenant's ability to pay rent. They're going to subject themselves to lawsuits, um, you know, down the road if they don't do that in a timely manner. And while the CARES Act moratorium on evictions has expired, Ganey says another protection is now in place. 
Under a CDC order from September, residential evictions for most tenants due to non-payment should be paused until December 31st. That doesn't mean that rent is not accruing. That doesn't mean that the tenant won't have to pay rent. They'll have to pay rent for every single month that they're occupying the premises. It's just getting pushed back. Even if an eviction proceeding is already underway, Ganey says tenants can still protect themselves. He says they need to fill out a home renter declaration online and submit it to their landlord and the courts. We are in America. There's no reason for nobody to really be homeless, especially kids. We reached out to the owners of the Efficiency Lodge, but they did not respond. UGA fans will see some changes at this weekend's game against Tennessee. This comes after the university reported more than 20,000 fans went to last Saturday's home opener. But now the students were seated, and many without masks. It raised concerns over social distancing. Here's Brittany Kleinpeter to explain the changes you will see on Saturday. People have been talking about the UGA versus Auburn game since Saturday, but much of the focus was on what happened off of the field. ESPN cameras captured some students who were maskless or not social distancing. We all just kind of scream. We're like, oh my goodness, no one's wearing a mask and they're all really close together. Although university officials say the majority of fans wore masks and followed social distancing guidelines, they did admit the student section concerned them. That's why fans will see changes ahead of Saturday's home game against Tennessee. Student seating will be redistributed to allow more space between seats. An athletics department official says additional staff in the student section will also enforce social distancing rules. The expected changes have drawn mixed reactions from students. Uh, ask for something that's not going to happen. I don't think it'll change anything. I think I'm going to go see how it ends up watching TV live for the whole game. And if it looks much better, then I might consider it because my friends and I, we really want to go. And game day, it's really exciting here on campus. I don't really think they have that much to worry about. But again, it's a pandemic and you want to keep people safe and the liability issue. UGA is organizing seats together by pods, which includes four people sitting together per pod. They say they are also following all SEC guidelines. The policy requires fans to wear their mask inside of the stadium, but they can take it off once they are seated. So we will see what happens coming up this weekend. As, as Brittany mentioned, that the uh, organizing the seats by pods is the way to go, but we'll see how that works coming up. All right, straight ahead, no stamp needed. How to make sure your absentee ballot is counted come election day. And in the next half hour, a COVID stimulus package remains on the table. But tonight, members of Congress are still trying to sort through the negotiations. We'll have an update from Capitol Hill. Spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. 
Georgia has already accepted more absentee ballots for this election than were cast in 2016. 264,000 people have turned in their vote. Nearly a million and a half Georgians requested an absentee ballot. Now, the state is offering an easy way to make sure that your vote is counted. No stamp required. Here's Liza Lucas. There are three options for sending in your absentee ballot. You can mail, hand deliver to your county registrar's office, or use one of these, an absentee ballot drop box. And there are regulations to keep the process in check. Drop boxes must be video monitored. They also must be located on government or county property and accessible to the public. Rules also require drop boxes be made to prevent tampering and built to withstand vandalism or bad weather. Want to use this option? You don't need a stamp for a drop box, but you do need to use a box in the county you're registered to vote. State election board rules require ballots be collected at least once every 72 hours, then collected daily in the eight days leading up to election day. Teams of two people who've sworn an oath, just like poll officers, will get the ballots. And rules require these ballots be immediately transported, processed, and stored, just like mailed absentee ballots. Drop boxes close at 7 p.m. on Election Day. 11 Alive's voter access team dedicated to giving you everything you need to make sure that your ballot counts this November. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to us. You can email us at whereatlspeaks at 11alive.com or text us directly. That number is 404-885-7600. And you can find all of the resources you need over on 11alive.com slash vote. We had another great day out there today. High temperatures were warm, made it up to 83 degrees this afternoon, and now it's a really comfortable night with mainly clear skies. Temperatures in the upper 60s now, and we'll be in those lower 60s at 2, 4 in the morning, and even the upper 50s here early in the morning with a few clouds that'll be mixing in with the sunshine as we start the day. Here's a look at your Thursday. We will see partly cloudy skies during the day, a, a lot of sunshine, just a few clouds that'll mix in at times. Temperatures, though, even warmer than they were today by about two degrees. We'll go from 83 that we had today to 85 for tomorrow with uh, those few clouds that'll be moving our way. All right, so let's talk about tomorrow's forecast. You can see how we're gonna be fine here. Just a few clouds coming in, mixing in with the sun during the day. Any rain is gonna stay mainly down along the Gulf Coast region. And these aren't necessarily uh, official outer bands, but it's just that moisture that's gonna be coming in from the Gulf that will bring those showers in along the Gulf Coast region. Then as we move into Friday, we're still gonna see a good coverage of clouds here, but I'm not really concerned about a big time rain chance here Friday, just a 20% chance later in the day as this hurricane Delta moves inland as we go into the afternoon hours here on Friday. This is a landfall most likely in the afternoon here along the Louisiana coastline. Still, most of that rain staying over to the west. Now, as the heavier tropical rain moves along with that area of low pressure, we will see on Saturday a few scattered showers that will start developing here. Not an all day rain event, not a heavy blowing rain or anything like that. We're just talking about some periods of rain during the day on Saturday with those bands of heavier rain over to the west. Then getting into Saturday evening, you can see these bands in Mississippi and moving into Alabama. Those are the ones that have the potential for some severe weather. And then we may see some developing bands even around here in Metro Atlanta with some pockets of heavy rain, maybe with some stronger storms with that. But the severe weather threat for now is on, on the low end. It's not out of the question. We can see a brief spin up, but those chances are going to be on the low end. So here's the storm we're watching right now back into the Gulf of Mexico. It is getting stronger now with max winds of 90 miles an hour. Again, we expect a new advisory in uh, before 11 o'clock clock goes back to a category three overnight Thursday into early Friday and then may come back down to a category two before landfall uh, along the Louisiana coastline on Friday and then we watch the remnants moving inland as that low moves up into Kentucky between the depression here and the low up of Kentucky we're on the right hand side of that track and that's when we see that potential for the rain to move our way as well as some of those uh, maybe some breezes around and maybe some storms developing but as you can see here on Saturday often on rain during the day Sunday We'll have some off and on rain that should taper off later in the day on Sunday and then by Monday a few possible showers there, but the rain chances will go down as we head into next week. 85 for a high Thursday and then only a 20% chance for a shower Friday with highs near 79. More clouds will build in though. Higher rain chances Saturday into Sunday. We'll be watching a lower storm threat as well, especially late Saturday into early on Sunday and then rain chances diminishing Monday at 30%. Only a 20% chance Tuesday and Wednesday cooling down to the mid 70s once we get in to 
to Wednesday as well. Take a look at your weather wow moment. This is from Lisa Stuckman from yesterday uh, where she got a picture of Mars. I know it's kind of neat to see that, but tonight Mars is the brightest that it's been in years and the brightest it'll be for years around. So maybe you saw that in the sky out there for tonight. We love your weather wow moments. We got this from Lisa, one of our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers. You can also be a part of that group on Facebook. Just search 11 Alive Storm Trackers and ask to become a member of this closed group. You can see what people are posting from their neighborhoods and you can post your weather information there too. All right, coming up safe and spooky. MRE doctors have been on the front lines of the pandemic with research and warnings tonight. Their advice for parents ahead of Halloween. And we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20. Doctors at Emory want you to start thinking about how your family is going to celebrate Halloween at the end of this month. Experts say there are safe ways to do it. Here is Mara Siriani with more. Well, this year you may not feel confident in sending your kids out to trick or treat or even to some of their favorite haunted attractions. But experts at Emory say there are ways that you can safely do some of these things. Emory University doctor Colleen Kraft says for starters, if you plan to host trick or treaters, use candy slides or grabber hooks to pass out candy. If your child wants to dress up, she says choose a masked costume. Use food service gloves to go through your child's candy. Set that bowl aside for at least a day to let any germs on the candy wrappers die. Or take this opportunity to start a new tradition like a neighborhood trunk or treat. Dr. Kraft says unless an event like a haunted house specifically advertises precautions, it's probably best to avoid. I think if there's a uh, haunted paths outside or something that um, is sort of been intentionally created to keep some of that social distance, uh, I think that those are okay. But I think if there's no indication that there's, they're thinking about the pandemic in the orchestration of the haunted house, I think those should be avoided. And Dr. Kraft says costume masks should work as long as they contain a cough or a sneeze. And and if a costume doesn't require a mask, she definitely suggests incorporating one. Hit with a pandemic and protest, downtown Atlanta has struggled to bounce back and is now facing billions of dollars in losses. Hard not to worry about downtown Atlanta. Next, a look at where the heart of the city goes from here. 
interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. protests, civil unrest, vandalism, and property damage, canceled events, closures, all happening in downtown Atlanta at the same time, sort of a, a confluence of a perfect storm and not a good one. Bill Liss and photojournalist Stephen Boise take an in-depth look at the heart of Atlanta, and you, it's impossible not to worry about the future of Atlanta above and beyond what Georgia State has done in gobbling up buildings. For downtown Atlanta, the year started out with lots of promise. Hotels at 75% occupancy, 50,000 or more retailers expected at the August trade shows at America's Mart. The restaurants and the stores were thriving. Then, in March, COVID-19 set in and the bottom of downtown Atlanta fell out. The Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau reports that more than $10 billion in revenue has already been lost and 80% of Atlanta's downtown hospitality workers forced out of work. Atlanta City Council President Felicia Moore confronts the two basic issues confronting downtown. I believe COVID is one of the first considerations that people are having as to whether or not it's safe to go to hotels, safe to uh, go in places where they're gathering with a lot of people. 
And then on top of that, uh, particularly for our business owners in the downtown area and other business corridors, you know, when is the next protest? Is it going to result in more property damage and vandalism? That damage caused on May 29th and May 30th, when protesters over systematic racism and inequality ended with looting and vandalism. But downtown is fighting back. In the middle of the COVID-19 shutdowns and protests, Derek Hayes, owner of Big Dave's Cheesesteaks on Fourth Side Street, has been determined to get both his and other businesses up and running. I've been through, you know, two things when my windows got broke out, but I understand that, you know, the community means everything to me, so I want nothing that, that, you know, letting that stop me from, you know, taking care of them, because without the community, I wouldn't be standing right now. Prior to that, I've given out um, $26,000 to help um, Black-owned businesses get back on their feet. I also, throughout the whole pandemic, I've been feeding frontline workers on hospital to hospital. And, um, I have took water boys off the streets to give them employment, you know, to help try to provide for their families. Also working hard to bring business back downtown is the CEO of Atlanta Cruiser City Tours, Stephen Chester. After a COVID shutdown, he started back up in May and is now running 12 of his 50 Segways and two of his five cars on downtown tours. He sees business coming back slowly, but coming back. All in all, we still are seeing people, whether they be locals or people just driving in or visiting Atlanta, are pretty good on those weekends. So it is not the suit and tie guest that we've seen in the past. It is a younger demographic, some people who are probably more open to being out and open and around others. But both Hayes and Chester face a formidable reality. The big crowd, says the president of the Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau, William Pate, won't be back anytime soon. I mean, the end of the year is going to be bleak. I think you have to be honest about that. We've got, uh, we only have two events left on the calendar, uh, the SEC Championship and uh, uh, Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. Currently, you would expect those would be played with no fans in the stands. But there is a ray of sunshine as Atlanta continues to battle COVID-19. It's from America's Mart. A major trade show in August tanked as only 20% of the 50,000 out-of-town buyers did show up. But now, a show set for October already has more than 4,000 registered. No problem. I was completely comfortable. But for many out-of-town buyers, like interior designer Teresa Davis of Denver, they say they have no intention of staying away from Atlanta or America's Mart. COVID doesn't bother me. Protests don't bother me. And because of my love at Atlanta, of Atlanta, I was thrilled to be there and had a wonderful time. And America's March senior marketing executive, Dorothy Belshaw, puts Atlanta and COVID-19 in perspective. So I would say that I think what we are experiencing in Atlanta is being experienced in many urban areas around the country. I think it's not specific to Atlanta. Central Atlanta Progress President A.J. Robinson, whose efforts center on downtown business, looks to next year. I think we're patiently, all patiently waiting on a vaccine. And uh, if you and I are talking a year from now, I think we'll be have a much better outlook about not only Atlanta, but all the urban cores around the country. With hotel occupancy in downtown Atlanta reported in April at a low of 10 percent, and now coming back slowly to more than 30 percent in August and business coming back as well, there is hope. But the Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau reports this caution. 2019 levels are not expected to come back in downtown Atlanta until 2023. I'm Reveal Investigator Andy Parati in Marietta Square, where an outdoor town hall wrapped up earlier tonight. It included dozens of community organizers concerned with inmate deaths at the Cobb County Jail. One of those inmates dying nearly a year ago this week. Frederick Thurman, age 36. Elvis Acom, age 34. They are the names of 50 people who died while in custody at the Cobb County Detention Center since 2004. Thomas Behar, 62. And event organizer Dr. Ben Williams with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference does not want the public to forget their names. All is not well. Okay, all is not well. There is ample amount of evidence that indicates that for many of them, their deaths could have been prevented. One death includes 
36-year-old Cadell Wingo, who died nearly a year ago this week. This past August, an 11 Alive Reveal investigation discovered video of him begging for medical help for hours as he slowly died. We want an actual criminal investigation into the people responsible for Mr. Wingo's death, and we're entitled to that. Last month, the Cobb County District Attorney's Office requested a federal investigation into recent jail deaths, and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation is currently conducting an administrative review of Wingo's death. We reached out to Sheriff Neil Warren, who runs the jail, but did not hear back. The former Minneapolis police officer awaiting trial in the murder of George Floyd released on bond today. Derek Chauvin was released from the Minnesota Correctional Facility this morning, then transferred to the Hennepin County Jail, where he then posted a $1 million bond. Mr. Floyd died on May 25th after policeman Chauvin pressed his knee against the neck while Floyd was handcuffed. Now all four officers are charged in that case and they have all been released on bond. This afternoon, Louisville police released files related to the internal investigation of the deadly shooting of Breonna Taylor. The files include several different documents and recordings, including officers, body camera videos from that night. This comes a week after the release of the grand jury recordings of jurors discussing the files. What would 2020 be without some social media controversy? The Chinese-owned TikTok site might be shut down as tension with China continues to rise. Joining me is a man who knows about tension and a man who posts some of the most risque TikTok videos I've ever seen, national columnist Ron Hart. Ron, what do you think about TikTok? Is it an enemy of the people here in the United States? To be fair, I just like them. I don't post them. Um, yeah, I think uh, there's some nefarious activity by the Chinese government around this TikTok thing. So there's a shotgun wedding between Oracle and Walmart and the Chinese uh, U.S. thing. So as a libertarian, I'm not a big fan of Trump doing that. It is very hard to live in the world in 2020 or 2021 if the United States and China are not getting along. I mean, this is not 1955 with the USSR. I mean, we are totally tied together uh, hand and foot economically. There, there's no escaping yeah. that. And that's probably why Walmart got involved in the TikTok deal, because they buy a lot of goods from China. So that needs to be rectified. I think we have a bad trade deal. Trump has pushed it. It may be to his detriment. This uh, virus is uh, still a lot to be told about the virus, where it came from. So that's, that's the story that will play out in the future, I think. The vice presidential debate happening tonight. I want to ask you about the plexiglass shield that will be used to protect the candidates. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, Kamala will be protected from Pence and perhaps COVID. And Pence will be protected from uh, Antifa and bricks being thrown at him. So, <laughs> Did you work on that line plays. all day? Is, was that line, that's prepared text, isn't it? No, I thought about <laughs> when I went to the 7-Eleven today and checked out. Okay. Los Angeles, <laughs> uh, very excited over the hillside Donald Trump sign over the 405 freeway and the 10-foot white letters at the Sunset Boulevard exit on Tuesday. Have, have you seen that in Southern California as of yet? Yeah, I've been out there a lot. Uh, you pull off Sunset Boulevard, you, you know, it's very dangerous there. Of course, the Trump sign is the most dangerous thing. But you also have OJ's house and you have the Charles Manson house. So there's a lot of danger in L.A. So all of Hollywood and all of Los Angeles wants to get Trump. They're going to get Trump. They're after him. They're going to get him. But I wouldn't worry too much. They, were, they weren't even able to get OJ out there. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. All right, Ron Hart, always thank you. Talk to you next Good week. Good to see you. Okay. After briefly weakening while going over land here at the Yucatan Peninsula, Hurricane Delta is strengthening again over the Gulf of Mexico, and it will continue strengthening as it gets closer to the Gulf Coastline. Stay with us. We'll talk about landfall and whether or not we'll have any impacts here. Braves continue their dominance in postseason play. Tell you what, offensively, they are a juggernaut right now. Let's hope they can keep it rolling. Body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their President Trump back in the Oval Office today amid fears that he may further spread COVID through a White House staff already reeling from a series of infections. Meanwhile, at the same time, Capitol Hill sorting out where stimulus negotiations stand after mixed signals from the president. Alice Barr of NBC with the very latest from Washington. A Marine guard today standing outside the West Wing of the White House, the first sign of what administration officials later confirmed. President Trump has broken his isolation and is back in the Oval Office, despite concerns about just how sick or contagious he might still be. The president continues to work. Uh, he's in uh, very good health. The president's chief of staff promised that safety measures were being taken to protect the huge numbers of people who work in the White House, which has suddenly become a coronavirus hot spot. The White House physician saying today the president's vital signs are stable and quoting him as saying, I feel great. At the same time, confusion on both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue about another coronavirus stimulus package. After President Trump abruptly tweeted he was stopping negotiations with Democrats on Capitol Hill until after the election. That sent markets into a tailspin until the president tweeted again that he would support a standalone bill for stimulus checks to struggling Americans. Democrats have long opposed a piecemeal approach to economic recovery. All he has ever wanted in the negotiation was to send out a check with his name printed on it. And as the vice presidential candidates prepare to debate tonight in Salt Lake City, a high stakes debate inside and out of the White House over whether President Trump will be healthy enough to face off against Joe Biden again next week in Miami.
Is your vote secure if you choose to send it in by mail? With more people voting absentee because of COVID, there are more questions than ever about election security and potential fraud. So how safe is the absentee ballot system in the United States? David Schechter has a look at the facts. Is voting by mail secure? Politicians, experts, and probably all of your neighbors are talking about mail-in voting and whether or not it's a safe and effective way to vote. Voting by mail began during the Civil War when both Union and Confederate soldiers could cast ballots in their home states from their distant battlefields. It's been sort of part and parcel of elections we've, we've for a very long time, especially uniform and overseas voters. That allowed and opened the door for really a lot of expansions in regular voters moving to vote by mail. Voting by mail has since come a long way, accounting for 25% of total votes in 2016. Currently, five states have mail-in voting for all elections. Opponents of mail-in voting point to double counting or voting on behalf of deceased people. But a recent Washington Post study of three vote by mail states found just 372 possible cases where this happened. That's a fraction of the 14.6 million votes cast by mail in the 2016 and 2018 general elections. Fraud certainly is possible, but it's not nearly as widespread as some make it out to be. There's this constant tension in election administration life between security and access. So the more accessible we make the system, you know, the more opportunity there is for fraud. I don't think it is widespread. I don't think there is massive amounts of mail fraud going on, but to say there's no fraud in the system is also, you know, disingenuous. As far as the large scale foreign attempts at vote by mail fraud, the FBI have recently stated that they have not seen a coordinated fraud effort and noted how difficult such an effort would be considering the decentralized nature of U.S. elections. However, Professor Atkinson does believe the rush to expand mail-in voting this year could make the system more vulnerable. So this really shifts things in a way that's, that's not typical. And so, you know, we, we're gonna expect later ballots. Look, we've seen that, you know, many ballots in these places have gone uncounted. There's been delivery problems of ballots to the voter as well as back to the election official. So, you know, in states that have this down, it's not a problem, but in states that aren't used to it, it's, it's really a big change. Even with those concerns, Professor Atkinson believes mail-in voting is a good option this year due to COVID-19. The circumstances are such that, you know, we should all vote by mail as much as possible. I mean, the, the system is, is very strong, really. Election officials, you know, work to make sure there's integrity to the system. We have to look at this as a, a, a single moment where we have to bend our system because of the circumstances and then we need to go back and let states evolve naturally into processes that make sense for their voters. Well, I have found something good for you to celebrate for 2020 compared to what we had last year. Do you remember last year when it was so hot and especially in September, we had those really hot temperatures and the record breaking temperatures. And remember last year we broke the record of the number of days at or above 90 degrees. We had 91 days at or above 90 last year. On average, we should have about 37. So that was a lot more last year. Well, look what we're doing this year so far, and hopefully we're finished with the 90s. We have had 45 days of temperatures at 90 or above, which is still above average, above 37 days, but it's a lot less than what we were dealing with last year. So if you're looking for a reason to celebrate in 2020, that's one reason uh, that we can talk about out there. Now today it was warmer than average. We got up to 83. It wasn't 90 though. Uh, the uh, record was uh, set in 1884. Both of these records are really long standing records. Our record high was 90 set in 1884. Record low was 37 set in 1889. So uh, we haven't broken a record on this date in a long, long time. We got up to 83 today. That's above the average by about eight degrees. We should be around 75 for this time of year. And it was a mild start this morning at 62, uh, where we should be around 57 for this time of year. We, are, of course, are tracking what we're what is happening with Hurricane Delta. It is getting a little stronger as it's moved over the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, it weakened a little bit over land. Now it's getting stronger again with 90 mile an hour winds. I'm expecting a new advisory in at any moment now. We'll have that for you tonight on up late on 11 alive, and I'll also post that 
also post that new update on my Facebook page and Twitter as soon as it comes out. You can see the watches and warnings that we have in effect. So far, no warnings. We have some watches. The yellow indicates the uh, thunderstorm, actually the th not thunderstorm, but tropical storm watches uh, that go in effect here for the eastern parts of the uh, Louisiana coastline, also over here toward parts of the uh, Texas coastline. And then this part that you see from the Texas line over more of the Louisiana coastline is where we have a hurricane watch in effect. Those are most likely going to be upgraded to warnings once we get through the day tomorrow and definitely into Friday. Uh, so higher rain chances are possible in north and northwest Georgia. On average, I think we'll see about one to two inches of rain here. These are these are the potential impacts from Delta here based on the track that we have right now. We may see some winds on Saturday and Sunday, 10 to 20 miles an hour, you know, just kind of breezy conditions at times and maybe a higher gust at times as well. And if we're still watching the storm risk, although with a little bit of a shift over to the west with that track, we think that the storm risk for severe storms or a tornado outlook is going to actually be a little bit lower. So here's that wind risk. You can see those stronger winds there moving into Louisiana. Here you can see the blue color indicating just 10 to maybe up to 20 mile an hour winds here at times uh, during the day Saturday, also into Sunday before those winds die out later in the day. Rainfall totals aren't that impressive either. You know, we're talking one to two inches of rain, but we're not talking about flooding rain or anything like that. So tomorrow dry uh, 85 for a high and then more clouds build in Friday. Rain chances Saturday Saturday and Sunday on the higher end, and then rain chances going down next week. Another shutout victory for the Braves, and now a chance for a sweep into the NLDS. Starting pitching was the concern for the Braves heading into the postseason, but it has not been an issue so far. It has been standout and terrific. How about this young man, 22 years of age, is Ian Anderson. He shined again, five and two-thirds innings of shutout baseball with eight strikeouts. He's yet to allow a run in his two postseason starts so far. Maria Martin has more on another Braves win and what is next. After the Braves shut out the Marlins 2-0 in Game 2 of the NLDS, Atlanta became just the third team in Major League Baseball history to have three shutout wins in their first four postseason games. And just credit goes to, the, obviously, the pitchers, and, you know, the guy putting the numbers down has done an unbelievable job. Travis has been, you got to give him credit, too, because there's there not a whole lot of shaking going on, and the game plan has been good. The guys back behind the plate are a huge part of it. Tyler and, and Travis do such a good job of keeping you in the moment, and... Uh, not trying to overdo things. Both Dansby Swanson and Travis Darno go yard once again. Back to back games of long ball from those two. But they said, look, head on a swivel. They expect the fish to bring it in game three. Just because they didn't get it done today doesn't mean they won't get it done tomorrow. That's the beauty of having such a deep lineup and, and a team that uh, consistently comes at you one through nine. So they'll come out swinging tomorrow and, and be ready to go. So the Braves are going to go for their second consecutive postseason series sweep on Thursday. And remember, the Miami Marlins have never lost a postseason series in the history of their franchise. Falcons are 0 4, first time since 99. That 99 season, by the way, is when Jamal Anderson was a holdout and then he tore up his knee in Dallas. Season was toast after that. That was after the Super Bowl season, too. So Dan Quinn here in 2020, still the head coach. A lot of fans don't like that, but it gets a little easier from here on out. The next four or five weeks, the schedule is softer. The Falcons have a short week, and then they start division play against a, a Panthers team that's not particularly good. Falcons keep hitting roadblocks. Julio Jones missed practice today, a nagging hamstring. Calvin Ridley barely got any touches at Lambeau on Monday night. Matt Ryan says they are a staple of the O, but it has to take more than just two to turn things around. Of course, Reed and, and Julio are a huge part of, of what we do, and they're great players, uh, and so you want to find ways to get it. But sometimes a game shakes out in a certain way, and uh, other guys have to step up and make plays. But to me, I think we're our best when we're balanced, uh, running the football explosive in play action pass game uh, and then rolling on third downs. Let me tell you, when he retires, Falcons are going to wake up one day and go, what we had with him we didn't appreciate. Atlanta United in Florida to take on Orlando City. They escape with a point after a scoreless draw, but there was one guy that stole the show. Five stripes goalkeeper Brad Guzon had six saves, though he does have the post to thank for a few. Atlanta travels to New York on Saturday. I just think Ryan is asked to do so much on that team. 
He is in a tough place, and they needed to put more around him. That's my view. All right, we'll take a break. We're back right after this. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasting. We're going to watch those uh, clouds mixing in with the sunshine during the day tomorrow. Highs near 85. It's going to be a lot warmer. We're still going to go with a 10 on the wasometer. Then Friday, even more clouds, but a low rain chance only at 20%. The higher rain chances will be here on Saturday and Sunday, where we're going to have rain, some breezes, maybe a few thunderstorms, uh, but just really periods of showers on Saturday and Sunday, not a total all day rain event on those days. And then the rain chance is coming down to 30% Monday, only a 20% chance Tuesday and Wednesday as we cool off again next week back to the mid 70s. Oh man, enjoy tomorrow and Friday because the weekend looks not so good. Hey, that's it for us. Uh, flip over to 11 Alive prime time right now for Uplay. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow night. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. 
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.